Ms. French? Here. Ms. Lomas? Here. Ms. Weber? Mr. Smith? And Mr. Hawkins? Thank you. All right, first, uh, we're just looking for approval of our minutes from our December 11th meeting. If you guys have had a chance to review, I don't know if there's I any. I move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Uh, moving on, is there any agenda adjustments? Chairman? Uh, no, Madam Chair, but I would like to welcome uh, Council Member Greg Hart, who is our new liaison to the committee, and he was recently appointed, and this is the first meeting we've had since he's been appointed and anointed. So, um, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Nice to see you. For your work. All right. Is there any public comment? I don't put there. Okay. All right. Just um, moving on then. Any committee member or staff communications? Okay, um, up next is our election of vice chair. Um, I don't know if we have anyone interested or any nominations. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd just like to, just like to remind the committee that um, we have a chair and we have a vice chair for this committee and uh, the way the committee normally operates is we nominate a vice chair and that person is available in the absence of the chair for uh, the course of the, the term of the chairmanship which is one year and then our normal procedure is to elect the vice chair and that vice chair becomes the chair of the committee after serving for a year as the vice chair and so um, tonight with the election of the vice chair we will uh, relieve you as of your duties and our current vice chair who is uh, Danielle DeSmith will take over as the chair in the middle of the meeting so um, so uh, if you guys want to decide on someone to nominate for the, for the, to take over the vice chair spot, uh, it's all yours. Do you have it? Okay, so there's a nomination for James Hawkins to be vice chair, and I think you need a, a second for that, and then take a vote. And second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Awesome. Congrats, and <laughs> now I'm going to uh, all right. turn it over to Danielle. One of the shortest campaigns in city history. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. We have Jeff Brinkman from the Ecology Consultants to talk to us about the Southern Coastal Santa Barbara Creeks Bioassessment Program and 2013 report. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for being here. Sure, good to see you all. Uh, so, as he said, the uh, Southern Coastal Santa Barbara Creeks and Estuaries Bioassessment Program, that was the annual program um, is what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> oh, that would help. All right, the microphone's on. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Jeff Brinkman with Ecology Consultants. I'm going to talk about the uh, Creeks and Estuaries Bioassessment Program. Um, so the purposes of the program, what are the, uh, the goals of the program? It's a long-term uh, monitoring program. We look at creeks and estuaries, and we try to uh, evaluate the ecosystem condition of those water bodies. Uh, we're trying to evaluate and determine responses of these ecosystems to natural and human influences and perturbations. Um, that includes uh, hopefully detecting impacts and sources of creek and estuary degradation, um, which we don't actually do specifically as part of this program, but it's at least a springboard for determining what some of those impacts might be. Um, and then evaluate the benefits of creek restoration efforts to creek and estuaries. Some of our study sites are actual uh, restoration sites or they're downstream of them. Our study area, uh, we cover the southern face of the San Inez mountain range from uh, the county line of the east in Carpinteria out uh, to Halama Creek, Point Conception. So that is our study area. 
specifically with the creeks, of course we have creeks and estuaries. The creeks, so we started with first, we've been studying those since 2000, so this is the 15th year of the program looking at creeks. Uh, the city and county cooperate in this effort. They both provide funding and have been involved uh, since the inception of the program. We look at between 15 and 20 uh, creek study reaches each year. The city's study reaches are throughout the Mission Creek, Sycamore Creek, and Arroyo Borough watersheds. There's a total of nine study reaches in those watersheds. And we study a full range of conditions. So we're looking at um, from disturbed creeks to relatively undisturbed creeks, from the headwaters to the ocean. So we're looking at creeks in the upper watersheds, for example, Rattlesnake Creek that has very little development, very little impact. Um, all the way down to the bottom picture is Mission Creek at De La Guerra, which is in the middle of the urban core. Uh, so we're trying to get the full range of conditions that we have. Uh, we also, that's why we go out, you know, out towards Point Conception, because we're looking at creeks on the Gaviota Coast that the county funds. And that provides us uh, with some more of that range of condition that we have. Estuaries, we've uh, studied for the past three years, so relatively uh, new to our program. We looked at six sites last year. We look at... Uh, what we call more disturbed sites that have, you know, a, a large degree of urbanization in their watershed, those uh, specifically being the Mission Creek, Sycamore Creek, and Arroyo Borough estuaries, which are all within the city boundaries. And then we've also been studying less disturbed estuaries. Uh, the picture on the bottom there is of Tecalote Creek out, uh, you know, a little west of Goleta. Uh, we also look at Halama Creek and Gaviota Creek last year. Um, which are also a less disturbed with respect to their watershed and the estuary body itself. Uh, bioassessment, so what is rapid bioassessment? What does our program involve? It involves using the biota, uh, specifically in our case we focus on BMIs, which are benthic macroinvertebrates, aquatic insects, crustaceans, and other invertebrates that inhabit the stream bottom. We use those as our prime indicator of ecological condition. So why do we use bioassessment? It's a proven methodology and it's cost effective. We get a lot of information, a lot of valuable information for a relatively low cost. Uh, benthic macroinvertebrates are the basis, like I said, of our program. Uh, like other subsets of organisms, they have varying tolerances to pollution and other sorts of habitat disturbance. So the presence of um, certain groups of benthic invertebrates in a creek might indicate a disturbance or it might indicate that it's in a relatively pristine condition if those are known to be sensitive species. Uh, biota provide a long-term measurement of health. They reside in the stream for months to years. That's also an advantage when you compare to water chemistry, which is also an important thing to look at, but it's a snapshot. As we know, water chemistry can be highly variable depending on hydrologic, hydrologic events, discharges of pollutants, uh, that type of thing. So really, the two can go hand in hand. Um, so what are we actually doing as part of this bioassessment program? We go out, we do field work uh, every spring for the creeks. We take uh, benthic macroinvertebrate samples from the stream bottom. Uh, we do some basic water chemistry. We're looking at dissolved oxygen, conductivity, temperature, pH, just the basics. Uh, we do a physical habitat assessment. So we look at the actual stream reach uh, we're evaluating, which is 100 meters of the stream. And we visually assess uh, using a EPA provided scoring sheet. Uh, we assess the stream bottom substrate, the flow in the creek, the bank stability, the riparian habitat. We visually assess all of those things and we come up with a physical score. Uh, we also make plant and vertebrate species identifications and we have a running uh, plant and vertebrate species list for each site that we've compiled over the years. There's a laboratory component. We take those benthic invertebrate samples, we take them uh, into our laboratory, we use a microscope, we pick the bugs out. We pick out 300 bugs per site, so it's standardized. We identify those bugs uh, typically to the family level, the taxonomic level, and that uh, use that information uh, in the calculation of our index of biological integrity, our IBI score, which I'll talk about on the next slide, which is basically an overall score of integrity for that particular study reach. We also uh, evaluate our data, we do data analysis, and we provide an annual report of our findings. So this index of biotic integrity, index of uh, biological integrity, what is that? Uh, that is a, it's a scoring system, a tool that we developed using uh, all of our available data from this program over, over the years. We've revised this IBI uh, once 
already. We're going to revise it again. We basically every five years kind of revise the IBI. Uh, we're looking at, at that data set from the highly disturbed creeks to the undisturbed creeks. What is the range of conditions? What are the different trends we're seeing with respect to the benthic invertebrates along that disturbance gradient, as well as along the gradients of uh, some of the natural parameters like gradient, elevation, watershed area, those kind of things. Uh, the IBI is a composite score of seven core metrics, which are scaled from 0 to 10, so the score totals from 0 to 70. Core metrics are things like uh, number of insect families present, so a diversity metric. Uh, the percentage of predators plus shredders is another one that we have. The percentage of EPT taxa, which are stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, which are known to be sensitive. These are, you know, uh, numeric metrics that we calculate. And these are metrics that we've shown through statistical analysis that have a very strong relationship with level of human disturbance. So they might be really high or really low in a reference undisturbed stream, and then they'll trend the other way and up to a highly disturbed stream. It's something we've shown with great statistical significance. Uh, we're condensing, so basically what we're doing is we're, we're taking all these different components that are related to different aspects of the benthic invertebrate community, to diversity, to composition, which different types of, of invertebrates, which different orders of invertebrates are we seeing, trophic structure, predators, shredders, collector gatherers, those type of things. All of these different metrics touch one of those aspects of the uh, community structure. We're combining all of those down into one score that we can look at and say, okay, we have different categories. Is it a poor stream? Is it a good stream? Is it an excellent stream? And that's based on our data set, how we come up with those scoring categories. So it's, it's a simplification. Uh, it's something that's easily understood. And all of this information, uh, the idea is for this to help us guide our watershed management decisions. We can identify impaired streams, impaired areas. We can compare those with reference streams and see where we'd like those streams to be. We can look at our restoration actions be, both before and after and see if we're, ha if we're having an improvement in the aquatic community or if we're not, what are some other things we might need to do. Um, so those are kind of the the ways that this IBI can be used. Um, if you have any questions along the way, by the way, just let me know. Some of this stuff is a little complicated. I'm doing the best I can to explain it. Uh, so what have we found so far? The IBI, it works um, with respect to determining uh, human impacts. Uh, if you look at the chart there on the right, you're looking at IBI score amongst different groups of stream study reaches. We have highly disturbed, moderately disturbed, and reference sites, which the way we come up with those categories is with our physical habitat score, as well as looking at the watershed development patterns in that watershed. So we are categorizing them before looking at the biological data, and then we're taking the biological data, in this case the IBI score, and seeing how well that correlates with those physical designations. So what we see is, is a very uh, distinguishable difference between highly disturbed, moderately disturbed, and reference sites. Uh, so it, it does work well for that. Uh, what we've also seen is that the impacts at, at these highly disturbed sites and even the moderately disturbed sites are relatively permanent. If you don't remove the development, the impact is going to continue to be there. You're not going to see a whole lot of fluctuation in IBI scores at some of these disturbed sites. And then we've also seen a, a good degree of accuracy with the IBI. It says 97% of three classes. So as an example, a reference stream we'd consider the IBI accurate if it's classifying it as fair, good, or excellent. If it was a highly disturbed stream, if it's categorized as very poor, poor, or fair, in this case, we're saying that it's accurate. So 97% of the time, that's been the case with these streams. Uh, there's also natural stressors, which we've evaluated. I apologize, the, uh, the chart there on the right is a little tough to read. Um, I'll get into a little bit what some of those numbers are. Um, but we've seen with the natural stressors, and I'll kind of go into what those are, we've seen that the creeks, they bend, but they don't break. They're impacted. You can see the impact after the effect, you know, after the stressor, and then we see recovery over a period of years. So one thing specifically that we've looked at is rainfall and peak flow effects in some of these creeks. So in really wet years when we've had, you know, significant rainfall and very high flows in the creeks, we have seen an impact the following spring. And, you know, it's not that hard to understand why this happens. 
you get a significant flow in a creek, it's bank to bank, it washes out the stream bed, boulders are rolling down the stream, and of course the bugs and the fish and everything else are going with it. So it makes sense that the next spring we find a somewhat denuded, uh, less diverse community, less dense community. With time, as the flows subside, the bugs come back, the fish hopefully come back, and we have recovery over the course of months to years, um, which happens in other types of you know, ecosystems. Uh, with severe drought, uh, we see some effects as well. If we have really low flow, we're not going to have a lot of flow in the riffles. We're going to have less riffle habitat, so we're going to lose some of the BMIs that live in riffles. Um, is dissolved oxygen levels drop. You know, when we have less flow, we have more stagnation. That's also going to cause some of these bugs to drop out. And obviously, if we have dry habitat, if we have a stream that dries up, then the habitat's less lost, and then the stream has to start over when the flows resume. Uh, let's go forward rather than backwards. Another major stressor, we've had some recent wildfires um, in the area over the last five or so years. Uh, the impacts of some of which have been real severe in some of our streams, um, particularly in the undisturbed creeks. Uh, the um, graphic there on the right shows different stream reaches. The top two, the uh, red, which is uh, our Rattlesnake Creek site, and the next one down is our, um, our next best site, as far as condition goes, our uh, Mission Creek at Rocky Nook site. You can see before the fire at year zero, they have really high IBI scores and the good, excellent range. Following the fire the next year, they're actually down into the poor range. So we see a massive drop following these fires that burned, you know, 60, 70 percent of their watersheds. Over the course of two to three years, then we have recovery. And basically after year three, those sites are somewhat back to normal. The sites on the bottom are disturbed sites. They're hammered as it is. They have low IBI scores. There's not really much room to drop, so you don't see really much of an effect from these type of, uh, from the wildfires. Uh, creek restoration projects. This is something we want to delve into a lot more. Uh, we've done just kind of some cursory analysis, just looking at IBI scores at Bonnet Park, which is on the old Mission Creek site. That's M2. And then Mesa Creek, which is AB5 in the graphic. Uh, Mission Creek was initially, uh, the restoration started in 2004, so it's been about 10 years now. This, this graphic's a little a couple years old, so it doesn't have the last two years of date on it. Um, and then the Mesa Creek site was done in 2007 initially. So what we've seen is, is what might be a modest improvement in the IBI score so far. So the work that's being done primarily on the riparian corridor, some in-stream modifications to the channel, we're seeing possibly what looks like it might be a modest improvement in the bug community. It's going to take more time and, and whatnot to really have a lot of confidence in saying that. Um, and, you know, I think what this shows is there's a couple things going on here. If we restore a small site, it's going to have some benefit. But if we really want to bring the creeks back to, to the max or to their, to their best level they can be at, we need to have a more watershed-based approach to restoration, which the city is also undertaking with stormwater management and that type of stuff. Um, and there's also, you know, there's going to be a limit to urban creek restoration. The development's not going away. The city is not going to be torn down. We're going to be here, and there's likely a ceiling uh, to how much the invertebrate community and how much the aquatic community is going to come back in these creeks. But obviously, we want to do the best that we can do. Uh, moving on to estuaries, so uh, you know, kind of a new endeavor. We're still in the in the beginning stages with this. We're still in the stage where we're trying to find metrics that can be good indicators of um, human disturbance. So we're calculating, you know, we've, we're calculating a suite of metrics each year, um, and we're comparing, you know, things related to abundance, diversity, dominance, other aspects of the BI community. And we're comparing these between the reference sites, our relatively undisturbed sites, and our, you know, more disturbed sites, and trying to determine, hey, are there any metrics that we see a difference that are higher in the reference sites versus the disturbed sites or vice versa? Um, this is inherently more difficult with estuaries because it's a harsher environment. You have wide fluctuations in salinity that has a huge impact on the biota. So you have inherently less diversity. There's fewer organisms, fewer invertebrates that can live in these communities compared to streams. So our job's a little tougher right off the bat. 
And one thing that we've already determined, fall sampling seems to be a better time. Uh, we did some spring sampling, and then we did some fall sampling and found we were able to discern differences better in the fall. And that's because these systems are having time to set up. The, the uh, freshwater input subsides, and they usually rise in salinity and become more stable compared to how they are in the spring. So what have we found so far? We have a very limited data set. We have a total of 12 sites so far in our data set that are usable. So that's really two years. Um, so it's, it's a small data set, especially compared to the creeks. We have, you know, 250 sites by now. But we are seeing, we are seeing some metrics that, that appear to have a lot of promise. Uh, the best that we have so far, percent uh, BAIM, that's a conglomeration of four different invertebrates, betadae, amphipod, isopod, and then misted shrimp. That shows, um, it, that's, it's there on the chart, it's kind of right in the middle. You see real high values in the uh, light green. Those are the, that's the reference site. And then lower values in the moderately disturbed and highly disturbed sites. So we see a big disparity there. The other one, percent COCO, that's a copepod, ostracod, cladocera, a ligachete. So that's four different organisms. We've noticed when you put those four together, they have a really high percentage in the disturbed sites, and it drops down with less um, development. So the reference average is a lot lower. And then percent moderately sensitive BMIs. These are uh, invertebrates that in, in the literature have been shown to be sensitive to pollution. That's another one where there are higher levels, uh, notably higher levels in the reference streams compared to the disturbed sites. And then percent predators is another one where that's happening. So. We're, we're seeing some promise. We've got at least four and potentially more with some more sampling uh, indicators that we might be able to use in an IBI someday. That's kind of what we're, what we're shooting for. Also, salinity effects. This is something that's really, we kind of touched on it, definitely worth mentioning. Um, we're not seeing much of a salinity effect, surprisingly, on our community metrics. So things like the, the metrics I just described, Two of them are illustrated here, the uh, percent BAIM and percent COCO. So far, we're, we're seeing those patterns hold true regardless of salinity. We've got low salinity on the left, moderate uh, salinity in the middle, and high salinity on the right. So far, the patterns are holding. We're seeing high percent BAIM in reference streams and high percent percent COCO in highly disturbed streams. I'm not re sorry, estuaries. There are some data gaps. We don't have any reference estuaries in high salinity category right now. Uh, we don't have any moderately disturbed in the moderate salinity category. So there are some gaps we need to fill in. Again, the actual number of sites we have is still really low. So we would need, a, we would need significantly more sites to really do meaningful statistical analysis. Uh, despite that, there, there are some notable um, effects of salinity on individual invertebrate taxa. We have certain taxa that we will only see in low salinity. Uh, we have a taxa or two that we'll only see in high salinity. And then we have others that are ubiquitous. We'll see them in all different salinities. So we're definitely seeing some patterns with individual taxa. Um, and then as far as the future, what are we doing this year? Um, we are further evaluating the creeks for drought effects. We had drought year last year. Obviously, we have another drought year this year. So that's a, a big crux of what we're doing is trying to determine what type of effect that's going to have on these creeks with lower flows. Um, this year we will be refining the creeks IBI. We have 15 years of data. We'll be going back through the entire data set, doing statistical analysis again, looking at relationships with land use and metrics, and uh, refining our IBI scoring system. We're studying more estuarine sites this year. We have at least nine sites that we'll be looking at. Uh, we're trying to get uh, some of those data gaps filled with respect to salinity and condition, you know, with respect to human land use. Uh, we'll further evaluate and refine our potential indicator metrics for the estuaries. And once we get to 40 to 50 estuary sites, maybe by 2016, we might have enough data to look at doing an IBI for the estuaries. So that's what we're kind of where we're going. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns? Leanne? What are you thinking about right now as far as the kinds of changes you might make to the IBI for the creeks? Well, it's, a, it's more of a refinement. The, the metrics that we have now are based on 10 years of data. They're pretty strong. Uh, but we'll put 
a wide range of metrics, again, through our statistical analysis, looking at relationships with land use. And there may be a new metric or two in there. There may be some revision to some of the scoring because we've got five more years of data. So we've covered uh, a few different sites, for example. We've covered different conditions with respect to rainfall patterns, wildfires. So there will be some refinement, uh, most likely. But it won't be a, a, a huge overhaul, most likely. Will we still be able to compare the new numbers to past numbers? Yes, and typically when we redo it, what we do is we go back into the past and recalculate the score for all of the previous sites. So that kind of eliminates that apples to oranges comparison. It brings everything back to an even playing field. Sure. Anyone else? What are the trends that you're finding? With respect to just long just term? Long term, correct. Well, uh, there's not necessarily a, like a notable overall decrease or increase in ecosystem health with the streams. Uh, what we're noticing is these episodic stressors like wildfires or different rainfall patterns, um, you know, having different effects on the creeks in different years. There, there hasn't really been like a, an overall trend, though, like, you know, with respect to climate change or anything like that. You know, that's something that would probably require a lot more time. But certainly with respect to individual reaches like restoration sites, that's a lot easier to determine, you know, because it's you have so many variables on a regional level. And there's a lot of variables on an individual level as well, but at least you're looking at one one spot. Are you seeing more complex systems on restoration sites? And and if so, how many years is, does it take to see that increase in diversity? Uh, that is another loaded question. It's going to depend on the site, and it's going to depend on the characteristics of that site, the upstream watershed, the types of human stressors. I mean, some sites are going to be easier to restore than others. They might only have a couple of major stressors, you know. Um, you get into the urbanized sites, and there's so many things that, that can be a source of impairment, you know, water quality, different water pollutants, hydrology, loss of riparian habitat, loss of connectivity with the uplands. So it really depends on the site. Um, as we kind of pointed out, the two restoration sites we've looked at so far are highly urbanized. They have highly urbanized watersheds. I mean, we're talking like 67% uh, 60, 70 percent urbanization of the watershed. And we've seen some maybe some moderate improvement in the aquatic community, the invertebrates. Now, there have been huge improvements in the riparian habitat. There's been huge improvements, most likely, in the use of that habitat by birds and that kind of stuff. But with respect to the aquatic community, you've got to fix more than just that particular reach. You've got to fix a lot of other things. Does that help at all? So I guess the next question would be, when you look at the restoration site, do you also go upstream or downstream of that restoration site to compare it to uh, an area that has not been restored on right. that same within that same basic area? Right. With the example of uh, Old Mission Creek, sort of. Um, it's a very short creek channel. It's disconnected from Mission Creek. But we do have other sites within the Mission Creek watershed that we've been sampling throughout the same amount of time. So they are, in a sense, a control because we're seeing the natural variability in those sites in response to different changes through time. Um, and we can compare that to a certain degree and say, well, hey, you know what, There's, there hasn't been much change at the upstream sites, and this site appears to have some sort of improvement over 10 years or 15 years or something. Uh, but it's it's also a, an issue of cost, and we'd love to have, you know, 15 sites on every creek and really be able to have a better control, um, but we don't really have the, you know, quite the budget to do that type of stuff. That's something in the future if we want to do future sites, and Jill and I were talking about this quite a bit today, uh, we'd like to have a more intensive monitoring program that doesn't just focus on the site but also focuses on a closer control site. That would be awesome. <laughs> You're welcome. 
I actually just had a question also looking at, it looks like we're increasing hopefully to nine estuaries for this year ahead, but we're hoping to get to 50 pretty quickly after that. And I was just wondering, it seems like a small increase right now and then like a huge increase after that. Is it just a budget restraint for the smaller well, increase? There's right certainly now? budget restraints. You know, we have a, a, a contract that we, we try and pack as, as much uh, research and information and analysis as we can into into that. So certainly if we had an unlimited budget, we could look at more sites. Obviously there's the reality of budgetary issues that we're operating under. That's, you know, 2016, that's three more years. That's maybe 30 sites if we're lucky. We've got 12, so maybe we're at 40. Maybe we've got an IBI at that point. Maybe it's a couple more years. It's, it's an optimistic uh, projection. There, sorry, um, I have one more question. Um, there's a number of other initiatives, of, such as plastic bags. I know you don't measure pollution, people pollution, but you're, you are doing these observations. It'd be helpful to know as you come back next year if you're seeing a market decrease in that kind of pollution, given the fact that a new ordinance is just being put into place. Sure, that's definitely something we can do. We're out there. Um, we can take notes, and if that's a priority, that would not be a problem at all to have some observations. Yeah, just make note of it. It'd be interesting to see if there's a change. Thanks. Sounds good. And I just had a brief question. Um, it seems like having 15 years of data on such a wide geographic area is pretty unique. I don't have any context for that. Is that so, are there other places in the country? that have been doing monitoring of this um, for longer periods of time? Is, uh, is this a pretty unique situation? I wouldn't say it's unique. I mean, there are several, you know, dozens, scores, hundreds of bioassessment programs around the nation. Mm -hmm. It's been around for a long time. Uh, California, you know, it's picked up steam a lot in about the last 20 years is when it's really come to the, you know, it's gained a lot of uh, support. And, and we have a lot more bioassessment going on in California than we did 20 years ago. Trust me, there's a you know, the regional, uh, the state water board has a, a swamp program. They're looking at hundreds of sites throughout the state every year. So it's a, it's a great data set, and it's uh, 15 years is a long time. Mm -hmm. So in, in Southern California, yes, I'd say it's, it's fairly unique. Mm -hmm. uh, there's probably a couple of others that could rival it, but it, it is, uh, we, have, we have some great data. Thank you. Oh. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of answers to some of the questions that came up, but I think it's pretty unique, and so that's why we're take the, taking the effort over the next year to do more analysis, and we've brought in um, one of the, I would say, the world's experts, Scott Cooper, who has worked with Jeff, and he'll be really helping do that analysis and ideally getting it out there where other communities can use the information. And then I also want to address the restoration questions, because those are some of my biggest questions, is what can we pull out of this data that's already been collected from our restoration sites. Um, as was shown in the plot here, we had, um, you know, the IBI score, but under underneath the IBI score are all of the different metrics that go into the IBI, and there's the different habitat scores. So can we pull out which of those we have improved and then where we do see improvement in the IBI or where, you know, could this, could this inform our future restorations? And so that's going to be a big section of the analysis that we're going to do this year. And in that um, Light, I'd love to kind of keep a continued dialogue with you because I think you have a whole other perspective on how the restoration information could be used. Okay. And they're going all over the county. And, and um, some you may not be aware of. Some are on private property. And some are specifically for um, steelhead and red lake frog. So <clears throat> there's um, a huge area that you could somehow sample if the funding came up or look at some of these restoration sites. And we have a hard time measuring um, how effective they are. I mean, we can measure, like you said, the bird populations in riparian and if the fish are coming back. But that's about it. I mean, we, <clears throat> there are snorkel surveys that go on. But again, they don't look at the benthic um, level. So this would be great. Oh, well, let's definitely continue. I know you asked about diversity. And so that is one of the metrics for the IBI. 
right? I mean, you oh, yeah. can even look at maybe the overall IBI hasn't improved as much as we would have expected at a site, but maybe diversity has, or, you know, mm -hmm. there are ways we can break it down. And, and so the more, sometimes we don't even know what questions to ask. So, and that's a great role for the CAC is to, to help fuel those questions. And this tool, right. I mean, can be used for any stream in the study area and probably a little bit one way or the other, east or west. Um, so if your restoration sites are within our study area, this would be a great tool to use um, if, if that's something you're, you're interested in, definitely. Sure. Oh, there we go. Um, really quick, Jeff. Uh, you mentioned that there's likely a ceiling for the more highly disturbed urban areas. And I was just wondering if you could go into that. Do we have any idea of other areas where we sort of hit that ceiling, what that ceiling would look like for us? Right. And that's... Uh... Again, you know, it's it's really going to depend on the creek and what can be done. You know, it, there's this cumulative effect of stressors, right? And and there's a straw that broke the camel's back. And in some cases, maybe that straw can be pulled off. And in other cases, there might just be too much. And you are maybe just going to get a small lift no matter what you do because you have such an impact of the hydrology, potentially to the water quality. You can't replant the riparian because you've got too many restrictions with respect to flood control. There's no there's no space to work with. Um, it's just gonna it's gonna be on a site specific basis, really. So you have to look at what your goals are, and what's realistic, and what resources do you have, and and then what are the best things that you can do. Um, and so it really is just kind of a site by site, watershed by watershed approach. And there's not really a, a one answer for that. I, I would just add to that that you you. Kind of want to consider your timeline that you're looking at as, you know, what kind of time frame you're looking at and as, as, uh, where your improvement comes from. A lot of those human-related impacts, the urban-related impacts, are things that have, have happened in this city and in most urban environments, say, over the last 100 or 150 years. And I think that people look at, uh, you know, uh, Jeff pointed out that we've been – studying this in California for maybe the last 20 years and here for the last 15 years and um, people's views on um, the natural environment, natural resource protection have, have really changed a lot in say the last 40 years. Um, and I think that if the city was being developed here today, it probably would look different than it, it does, especially as it, as it pertains to the natural resources and the creeks in the city. And, um, I think as the city goes forward and things are redeveloped, uh, they can be redeveloped with more sensitivity to protection of those resources. And you'll see, you know, it's it's incremental, and you'll see that um, you'll see the the health of those systems start to improve over time. And and I kind of like the way Jeff put it: you don't know where the point is where you take the straw off the camel, and. Uh, that's kind of an interesting way to to look at it, but at some point you do kind of cross that threshold, and you and you might see, you know, your your curve might start going going up at a much faster rate. But I think that you know it's it's a problem that's developed incrementally, and it and at least my view on it is if you look at it long term, it's one that can be undeveloped incrementally as well. Right, and sure, and I mean if we understand the stressors and the causes. And we do that through investigation. First, we, we establish the condition of a site. Then we try to understand what's causing it. And then we try to deal with those causes as best we can. So that's kind of how restoration should work. Okay. Any other? One, one last thing I would point out is one of the reference sites that we were looking at, or not reference sites, but one of the, the sites uh, Jeff's been examining is Mesa Creek. And um, just to refresh everybody's memory, at, at, at one point, Mesa Creek was put inside a pipe and completely buried. So there was uh, probably not much living up there at all. And so it's been it's been daylighted and, and has an opportunity now to, uh, you know, definitely is providing much better riparian habitat and has an opportunity to kind of to kind of regrow. So so from its starting point was. Uh, you know, essentially dead. I mean, it was gone, and so um, that's a that's a pretty major resuscitation. But it does still have all of the all of the urban stressors around. It's got a major thoroughfare right right next to it, um, 
uh, cliff drive and uh, upstream urban suburban uses and so uh, so it's you know urban stream restoration is challenging but that that's one where it went from I mean literally in a pipe and then the other place we're measuring over at Bonnet Park you know essentially the headwaters for that is a is a west side storm drain I mean it's all of the 600 acres of of urban development and running off into a pipe and then going in and that's going right into that 500 feet or or 600 feet of stream so it's a um, it's a pretty tough site to to uh to restore and you know one of the things we may want to look at is and we just purchased that property up on barger creek so it's it's a little bit further up in the watershed there are agricultural uses and and suburban you know low density residential uses up there the creek is pretty um, you know, devastated. It's very, it's degrade, it's very degraded, and it might, but it might be interesting to look at a site like that that has less of the urban influence and see what kind of, you know, see what our our BMI growth is in that area as compared to those more highly highly urban areas. That one probably has a higher ceiling, for sure. <laughs> Any further discussion? Okay. Thanks very much, Jeff, and thank you, Jill Murray, for joining us and uh, adding your comments. And now we have a second business item this evening, the fiscal year 2015 budget. We'll turn it over to Creek's Restoration Water Quality Manager, Cameron Benson. There you go. All the way to the left. All the way to the left. There you go. <laughs> okay, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Sorry for the delay with that. Um, tonight I'll be presenting our proposed fiscal year 2015 budget for the Creeks Division. Um, I want to start out by just reminding everybody about our budget process. Most of you have been through this already, but um, as you know, we the city operates on a two-year budget, and this is the second year of that of that two-year plan. Um, we're just going to be reviewing the second year. The the uh, Creeks Advisory Committee Budget Subcommittee met on March 17th. We went through the budget and detail, line-by-line line detail of um, everything that's in there. Um, the entire city budget was was presented yesterday by the city administrator and finance director to city council, and so this is actually the first day we're able to present to our advisory committees and our commissions. And I just came to this meeting from the Parks and Recreation Commission, which uh, I presented our Creeks Division budget to them. I want you to know that there was concern among the uh, members of the commission that they didn't have your recommendation and they didn't they weren't sure they wanted to go forward with a recommendation to council on this until they heard from you. Ultimately, they uh, they did make a recommendation to council to, in support of the proposed budget, but it's subject to uh, concurrence essentially from this committee. Uh, and and they had some discussion about. Re-meeting. If there were issues that the committee had, they had some discussion about re-convening uh, so that they could hear that and and change the recommendation. So I just want to let you know that the uh, your action tonight is not in vain. So um, and then uh, we will go to city council on May 19th with the Parks and Recreation Department budget and the Creeks Division being part of that department. We'll will present the uh, budget to the city council at that time. Um, and again, all of these meetings are noticed public meetings. So now moving on to the Creeks Fund, as you all know, um, 
Most of the funding for the Creeks Division comes from the voter-approved Measure B, which is a 2% transient occupancy tax or hotel bed tax, that, uh, uh, and those funds are placed into a special fund and they are restricted to pay for stormwater and surface water quality improvements and creek restoration. Uh, the Creeks Division receives no funding from the city's general fund, and the proposed budget is consistent with Measure B and also consistent with the Creeks Fund funding guidelines that have been reviewed and approved by the uh, Creeks Advisory Committee most recently in January 2010. Um, and I just want to say the, the budget that I'm presenting tonight is essentially the same. There are a couple changes that I'm going to talk about, but essentially the same as what you saw as the FY15 proposal in the, out of the two-year budget plan. Okay, now getting into the numbers, I'll start with our, um, our revenues. Uh, our FY15 TOT revenue projections from the Finance Department are up from... Um, the 2014 adopted numbers by $267,000, which is an eight and a quarter percent uh, increase from what we adopted in 2014. Now you can see the there was a small um, adjustment that the finance department made in the middle of FY14, but now we're we're proposed to see another increase for FY15. Um, as we discussed in our capital improvement program meeting back in November and again at our subcommittee meeting in March we're proposing to transfer uh, approximately two hundred and twenty thousand dollars from our reserve to to balance our budget uh, we've done that the last several years because we really increased our capital program spending uh, over the last few years and um, but just by way of example last year in the FY 14 budget we adopted um, we were planning to transfer seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars from reserves into the into our operating budget or into our capital budget this year it's two hundred and twenty thousand so it's a, a kind of a big drop from what we did before um, I also want to note that our revenue projections do not include any funds from pending or future grant applications so these are these are our forecasted dollar amounts coming in but not we don't forecast revenue for grants. Okay, and on the expenditure side, our proposed FY15 budget is is substantially the same to F, as FY14. Um, there are a few notable exceptions. Uh, the largest change is that in the FY15 budget includes a, a decrease in funding for for our capital program. So, um, as you can see in the bottom row here, FY14 we we had a, a mil, 1.67 million going into um, our capital program this year. It's two hundred thousand dollars less at 1.47 million. Um, the other, the other major difference is a reduction of the Measure B transfer to the street sweeping fund next year, and so that's uh, up here in the transfers out section. Um, we were, were. Our, the Measure B contribution to the street sweeping program will be about eighty thousand dollars less than uh, than it was um, planned to. Or, excuse me, than it was in two thousand fourteen. So the reason for that is some program changes in the street sweeping program, uh, as well as the formulation that is being used to determine how much Measure B funds to use. This is an issue that was a, a pretty significant issue for the committee last year, so I don't, I don't want to, um, and, and I, so I don't want to shortchange the committee in terms of the analysis this year, except to say that uh, two things: one is the projections going out into the future have pretty significant increases year after year from Measure B into that program, um, and I don't really want to get into a lot of detail about that tonight because. The uh, streets division staff is still working on a report, and I want to come back and have a, a more full discussion of the street sweeping program and its relation to water quality and its relation to Measure B and so forth. And um, uh, so, for for this year, the proposal is is a pretty significant redu reduction in what was planned for this year. Um, but going forward, I think the committee uh, 
would probably appreciate a, a larger discussion and looking at the whole program and looking at the analysis that's part of that report. So I think that will probably come back to the committee probably in the summer. Um, so we can, we'll hear more about that then. Okay, here's a budget breakdown by, uh, by category in the budget. It shows our different line items as a percentage of the overall budget. As you can see, at 38%, the Capital Improvement Program is, represents the largest portion of the budget, followed by salaries and benefits and supplies and professional services uh, at 22%. And then, as we've done in the past, we wanted to break the budget down by our major program areas. So Creeks Division has three main program areas, water quality improvement, creek restoration, and community outreach. And this is how our proposed FY15 budget breaks out overall. And the table really kind of demonstrates how significant the impact is of our capital program on the percentages um, and also why those numbers can change pretty dramatically from year to year, depending on what capital projects we're, we're funding. And so if you just look at our operating budget, you see that water quality is, uh, programs are 49% of that, creek restoration at 26%, community outreach at 25%. Now, those are pretty pretty close to what the committee set up as its desired goals years ago um, at 50, 25, and 25. Um, but, when, but when you add in a capital prog program from any given year, uh, you can see for this particular year, our creek restoration number goes goes way up. And since community outreach is not really a capital program, that percentage looks like it goes way down. <clears throat> okay, again, this, this chart uh, breaks our expenditures down into those three main program areas. And again, um, you can see here when you're, when you're breaking those things out, how much the capital, uh, you know, uh, capital program takes up a lot of uh, a lot of space, and um, we just happen to have a significant amount going to creek restoration in this year's capital program. Um, so our main highlights from the proposed 2015 budget are, um, first, as I noted earlier, the finance department is forecasting a $267,000 increase in Measure B revenues, so that's good news. Um, second, our capital improvement transfer is lower by $200,000 than it was in the 2014 budget. Street sweeping program is $82,000 lower than uh, than it was in our FY14 budget and closer to $90,000 lower than what it was supposed to be uh, for FY15. Um, we are looking at uh, increasing our water quality research coordinator position from a half-time position to a three-quarter time position. The reason for that is uh, a couple of things. One is, as you guys know, part of our our monitoring and research plan involves our project uh, monitoring. So as we do capital projects, water quality projects, we want to monitor those and determine how effective they are to see if we want to keep doing that kind of work in the city. Uh, as we do more projects, it takes more time to do that. And then also the new statewide uh, NPDES permit under the Clean Water Act um, has a lot of additional monitoring requirements. Now, this person won't be doing all of that work, but they, but um, our research coordinator does uh, do our research plans and does the analysis of of our um, data collected during the monitoring. So, we're getting kind of an increased workload, and it's just uh, we decided we'd add an extra quarter time. The cost on that is about twenty eight thousand dollars a year. And then um, our transfer from reserves, it, as uh, again, is um, lower than in past years. Uh, but we're, um, our, our, I think, our reserve balance is still still healthy, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, we're proposing to continue with our water quality monitoring and research in FY15, and and basically at the same funding levels as FY14. I guess with the exception of what I mentioned in terms of our staffing on that. Uh, we have several other continuing programs that are funded at the same levels as they were in FY14 and same as what we had proposed last year for this for this year. Um, and that includes our, our creek cleanup contracts, our wa youth watershed education, uh, electronic and print media campaigns, as well as our city TV and, um, and committee meeting work. 
Uh, this is a table listing the capital improvement projects that the committee identified during our, our November 2013 meeting, which are all included in the proposed budget. Um, we've gone through all of these before, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them. First, the Las Positas Valley Restoration Project is receiving some funding. That's, uh, that is our uh, restoration project we're working on on Las Positas Creek, and that's the creek that runs right along Las Positas Road. Uh, what you mostly see from the road is a concrete channelized section of the creek. No BMI uh, in there. Uh, we're looking at a uh, possibility of removing all or some of that concrete to try to restore that that section of creek. Um, we've be, we've begun our technical studies on that, and we will come to the committee with a, a conceptual design as soon as we have that. We're also um, doing outreach with the neighbors in that area. We're hoping that uh, you know, that, that, air, that area does have some flooding issues on big, big flows, and we're hoping uh, we might be able to improve the, the flooding situation there as well as, as the creek and also looking at some other um, things, interests the city has in terms of um, uh, tr transportation or pathways uh, along that area that are off the road and, and a little bit safer or a lot safer. Um, Second, the, the second one on the list is stormwater treatment retrofit projects. I think um, the committee is aware that we have installed the um, retrofit demonstration projects in a lot of park areas and parking lot areas. Um, we have a grant pending right now for our next uh, demonstration project, which would involve some street identified streets and sidewalks and alleys in the city. Uh, so we're we're excited about that. I think I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. And then third, uh, the, the fourth one on the list here is the Upper Royal Borough Watershed Restoration Project. And that is uh, the name we've given to the that uh, Barger Creek restoration and the property that we recently purchased. And so uh, we have a little bit of funds that, that City Council had approved to do some preliminary work up there, but we're, we're adding some more funding to uh, to that so we can... So once we develop a, a restoration plan for that area, we can implement it. And uh, that is just as a reminder to the committee, you know, when you see these numbers, some of these you've seen before. In fact, every one of these projects has been funded through our capital program before. But what happens is, you know, we have to go through our design and permitting work before we can be in construction. And so what we try to do is set aside a little bit of money each year for these projects so the public knows where Measure B monies are going. The committee knows where Measure B monies are going, and um, and then when we get to a point where we actually have the plans, we've got the money in the bank to either spend to to build a project or to use as a grant match and and leverage that money to to actually put the project in. So we kind of plan over a series of years to to be able to have the project funded, and we don't just end up with lots of designs for million dollar projects and have no money available or choose one to to be able to implement. Okay, on our uh, reserves, the, the purpose of the Creeks Division maintaining an unappropriated reserve is, is for capital projects, grant matches, and for revenue shortfalls, uh, particularly tied to poor economic conditions. So the, in the past, the committee has recommended uh, a, maintaining a reserve balance that is equivalent of, of two large projects. <clears throat> That's a variable for us. It, it, um, we've we've sort of set that number as uh, as a million and a half dollars because at the time that's what it had cost us to do the Arroyo Borough uh, Estuary Restoration in Mesa Creek. Um, so we've we've sort of set our target reserve balance at about three million dollars. Um, the proposed budget we look we're looking at ending up at two point nine million dollars at the end of of this fiscal year. That's a little bit higher than what our projection was uh, um, uh, at the beginning of last year, and that also includes um, the fact that we've spent another million dollars, basically nine hundred thousand dollars, out of our reserve to purchase that property that we didn't know we had coming. But we also uh, received some grant funding. We also you know, uh, we are uh, as cheap as we can possibly be as we're going through and spending money through our operational budget through the year, so we always have savings from that. And then we've been buoyed a little bit by um, higher-than-expected TOT levels. So um, 
So our reserves actually coming in higher than we expected it to be at the end of the year, even though we spent an extra nine hundred thousand dollars this year. Uh, so we are proposing to transfer two hundred thousand uh, um, dollars to help fund our capital program this year. So we expect to end FY15 with uh, two point seven million dollars in reserve. Pretty healthy reserve for our size program, for sure. <laughs> Um, FY14 was a relatively slow grant year for us, particularly uh, when it's compared to the last several years for the Creeks Division. We received one $10,000 grant from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's for um, planting native trees up along the top of the bank of the Caltrans Channel near the Fish Passage Project that we that we put in. Um, that'll fund uh, somewhere between a third, or a quarter to a third of that project. Um, it's not for lack of of trying. I think uh, we we had a couple grants where we were not successful, um, but more importantly, uh, I think what it what it shows is um, the you know the cycles. Grants are cyclical, and sometimes grants come around that really fit our projects, and sometimes they don't. And frankly. Um, a lot, many of the grants we've gotten have been endangered species related, and so if we don't have a project that's particularly focused on uh, endangered species recovery, we're not eligible for those types of grants. And so, it's sort of identifying what's out there, what's, and then kind of forecasting what's going to be out there, and try, you know, if we want to take advantage of that money, uh, looking at the city's priorities and how we can move projects up in priority uh, to to fit a, a upcoming grant. And it's not necessarily chasing the money. It's just one of the factors we look at in terms of setting the priorities. So as I mentioned earlier, we do have a pending grant, $2.3 million grant with the State Water Resources Control Board for the stormwater treatment retrofit project on the streets, sidewalks, and alleys. We should hear about that um, in the next uh, month, I think that by the end of May, we're supposed to hear about that. And um, uh, so even though we're going to hear about it this year in FY14, it won't get booked this year because we have to go to council and get approval uh, to enter into the grant agreement. So it would be booked next year. So this is a, um, a graph that shows our ca where our capital improvement funding um, comes from. And the green is grant funding that we've received and the blue is measure B funding. All of these except for FY15 are actuals. So you can see, you know, in some years we've we've gotten almost four million dollars in in grant funding. Almost every one of these years I think that's the the smallest one, a million dollars. So this one looks pretty um bare, I guess. Uh you know, it's barely enough to shade the top of that bar. But um but that's the way it goes sometimes. And I think if you look back on the whole program, about I was just noticing this today, about every five years we hit one of those. And, um, uh, you know, our, our overall goal, goal for the program that we set early on and have, have really focused on maintaining was can we um, match all of the Measure B, can we match 10% of the Measure B funds that we get every year? And that was kind of our our bar for success. And, you know, as you can see still, and we look back five years, and in two of those years, um, well, this is, the blue here is just capital spending, but in two of these years, the, this one, uh, to FY10 and FY13, we received more in grants than we did from all of the Measure B fund together, so it was more than 100%, and over the over the life of the program, we're, we're well beyond the 10% the goal, almost $15 million in, in grant funding over that time. And so with that, I'll conclude, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks, Cameron, for that report. You said that, um, we, did you find, just to follow up on the grants, there were fewer to apply to, or you applied to about the same number, or? We had fewer that we applied to. I think, um, you know, our, our, our we have a performance measure where I just, kind of arbitrarily picked a number and said we're going to we're going to apply for a minimum of four grants every year. We're just going to find something and some of some of them are s small like that. We've had good fortune lately where we we've decided 
you know, some of the small grants aren't really worth our staff's time because you have to, you know, write the application, then you have to um, mo uh, do monitoring that's associated with it, and then you have to do reporting. And <laughs> people involved in nonprofits on the committee are shaking their head, nodding their heads. Uh, yes, we know all about that. So, so we've had uh, good fortune lately. There have been some large grant opportunities for us, and we've we've kind of gotten spoiled. Um, but there's another side to that. So a $10,000 grant with the Fish and Wildlife Service, yeah, it's going to cost us some reporting time. It costs us some time to, to put the application together. But part of it is uh, developing and maintaining relationships with uh, with those granting agencies. And those things are, are really important. And then, uh, you know, delivering on the grant and beyond expectations. And that opens up opportunities for us in the future. So, uh, for example, uh, in FY13, I think we probably uh, submitted, I think our, our goal was four. I think we submitted something like 12, 13, 14 applications this past year, four. And it was just, you know, what's what's there? What's going to work for our program? What do we have a reasonable shot at? Um, and uh, next year, we're we'll see what's on the horizon. So one of the things that's happening with these big money, the big money out there has come from um, bonds that were passed by voters, state bonds that were passed by voters back in, gosh, some some of them um, were very early, 2004. The the one that we're, we have an application in for now was a bond pass, passed in 2006, but those things are starting to go away. They're, they're starting to be spent. And so... Um, so those big opportunities are going to become fewer and fewer, and so we're going to get back to looking to cobble together more small stuff. Other than endangered species, are there any other hotbeds of grant availability that we could either <clears throat> have tapped in the past or look into leveraging? Yeah, that's a great question, and um, we are getting um, more creative. We're working across the city uh, more uh, w well, one I should say one grant that's not on here that is helping our program is we have in this year's budget we have a twenty thousand dollar redu reduction in our invasive species removal program our Rundo removal program and the reason is we developed a partnership with the county agricultural commissioner's office to do the Arundo removal and they got a grant that can now help pay for that. So we're, so we're able to reduce our spending because of a grant of another agency that we're partnering with. So that's, that's one example. But some of the, um, some of the other areas we're looking at is there, back in 2006, there was also a major flood control bond passed, uh, Proposition 1E. And one of the things that they're, they're interested in is non-structural or non-hard flood control. Um, so it's similar to the stuff, you know, We've got to build flood control into all of our all of our rest, creek restoration projects. We can't restore a creek if it's going to flood the neighbors, obviously. So, um, so we have we have the potential for that kind of crossover there, and we get a lot of points because we're we're really focused on the biological or the environmental benefits. And so, flood control is one area. Transportation is another area. So. Um, so Caltrans has things uh, uh, available that we are looking at for opportunities, and those can involve uh, bridge replacements. Um, it can, they, um, they can involve uh, environmental impact mitigation for other Caltrans projects. They, they have a program where they do extra environmental mitigation. So if an EIR has been done on a Caltrans project and it identified some adverse environmental impacts, they have to mitigate those under state law but then they have a program where they can give a grant to a local community to do extra mitigation to help not just mitigate, but try to help improve things. So, um, so we're looking at, at every opportunity. And you said the capital improvements are making up a larger portion of the budget this year than in years past. Did I hear that right? Um, I would say for the, in the last five years, uh, we have really, um, based on direction from the committee, based on hearing from the community, we've really increased our capital program, probably in uh, five, five, six, seven years maybe. Um, our capital program used to be a, a, in the more of the six hundred dollars to $750,000 range, and I think at least in the last five years we've been double that every, every year after year after year. And so 
Um, you know, as I look out at our capital program over the next uh, six years, they're, they're all right in that million and a half level. I just want to say once again that I really appreciate having had to write grants before. I really want to commend the um, your team for their success in grant writing and the receipt of those grants over the years because it's really enabled you guys to do much more than we ever could have just off the Measure B funds. Thank you. And I just want to thank you. I think it's pretty unique to go into the this level of detail with the committee, and it's really nice to have. Any other questions, comments? We're going to wait to discuss street sweeping until we get the full presentation later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So does, is there a motion on the presentation and the fiscal year 2015 budget. I um, move that we approve the 2015 fiscal budget. And just as a point of clarification, um, we're what we're actually doing is to make a recommendation to the to the Parks uh, and Recreation Commission and to the City Council to approve it. So. We, oh, the committee unfortunately you mean doesn't we have can't, the authority. We can't approve it right here and now. It's, uh, it's this question. guy over here. <laughs> so, um, so just as a point of clarification, I think Thank it's you. Too so moved. Correct. Thank you. Is there a second? Good. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain? No. All right. The recommendation has been made. And uh, is there a motion for an adjournment if we don't have any other matters? Make a motion to adjourn. Aye, second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.